Uh, she's a family office. I'm sorry she wasn't able to make it. Eric, I see you, but let me just make sure I can hear you okay. You've got a microphone in front of you? I do. Okay, coming in clear. So uh, Eric is a, a PhD general partner at Impact Venture Capital. Um, he got his PhD at the Drucker School of Management out in Claremont. Um, Eric is a technology finance professional, investor, board member. And I think what makes him great here today is over 30 years of experience in the VC space. So I think we'll learn a lot about your fund, the VC space. Um, he worked at Oracle, so he worked with Larry Ellison for over 11 years. Um, he sat on numerous boards, Cap Connect, um, 3C, AI. He's been a VP. He's been a treasurer. Um, and he's worked with some great firms, you know, Flectronics and Cisco and Avery Dennison and AT&T. So I think all of those really have helped you not only form your, your own fund, but more importantly, that knowledge base that you'll be able to give back to family offices. And Laura, I see you, but I just want to make sure that uh, I can hear you. How's your audio? I think it's good. You're good. MBA from Harvard Business School and undergrad at uh, University of Chicago. Her fund is SVC, uh, which is the Silicon Valley Data Capital Venture Fund. It's dedicated to investing in fintech, software, artificial intelligence, and analytics. Um, she's been a banker. She has an enormous background um, making investments in Yeshi ID, Dorsted, uh, PowerSet, um, Scout, Facebook, Rev Genomics. So being an investor like her into other companies, I think will gain good insight into how does she really pick those companies and why are they in her portfolio? And then later on, I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about how you uh, work with the Harvard Business School's Global Alumni Board. I know you sit on that board and we'd love to hear sort of the insight that you're able to take from that. But more importantly, what are you hearing? What are you hearing in venture capital from that group? So I think that would be quite exciting to learn more about it. So, Ellie, I'm going to take the first question with you. Um, and because you do have a fund, and I think this is going to be, you know, relevant, obviously, to everybody here to learn about how VCs put together their portfolio. Tell me how you handle direct investment requests from your LPs. I think we should start there. And then how do you make the most of that relationship for the fund um, for your individual LPs? Sure. Thank you. Um, I will give quick background um, just to elaborate a little bit more on my background in that it's a, a bit unusual in terms of my path to venture. I've spent 10, 15 years exclusively in natural organic food, um, 10 of which were spent at Whole Foods overseeing local brands and product innovation. And um, those years, 2008 to 2017, were really this sort of boom or renaissance in terms of natural consumer. It's when Americans started to pay more attention to their health and we pre created a real infrastructure and platform at Whole Foods to launch um, these sort of next generation consumer brands. And I was lucky to be at the center of that ecosystem. So um, I had the chance to move over to investing and was sort of incidentally groomed for venture capital in those 10 years of working with founders and visiting production facilities and getting a real um, acumen for what works in consumer food. And as I moved to the investment side, found how valuable it was to have operational experience and to have had the years that I did, um, not only in consumer food, but also in food technology investments. Um, that's actually become a pretty unique strategy that we have just in terms of um, supporting food tech businesses who have largely generalist or tech investors only on their cap table. And so we really try to bring a differentiated um, you know, support on the cap table in that way. So that's just some background pre, pre new fare. Um, but in terms of direct investments, I think it's always a conversation. It's a topic that comes up. And the way that we've treated it is we see it as a valuable piece to why you would invest in new fare in the first place. We're specialists. We invest in food only. So we all consider ourselves to be a bit higher conviction venture in that sense because we uh, only play in the food and, and bev sectors. Um, but with that said, for our largest LPs, we include a co-investment acknowledgement. So rather than, you know, we're, we're first time fund, so we have um, a handful, we have over a dozen LPs. So for us to give a co-investment right to every single one of those LPs actually works against you, the LP. So rather we've given it as um, sort of a special treatment to our largest checks. Uh, each one of those LPs has a co-investment acknowledgement, which means that we tried to build the relationship with you. We wanna know what are you interested in? What excites you? Um, bring you those direct deals when there is an opportunity, but largely when we're coming in first time, it's a highly competitive deal and, and we're getting let in and we have access as a new fair because of our 
value that we're adding. So um, where this becomes, I think, even more interesting to LPs is on later stage rounds when we're no longer participating. It doesn't make sense for our portfolio construction, but where we can offer up our pro rata. So we've sort of, um, I think, handled it in, in both ways. That's hopefully a benefit to you, the LP. We know what you're interested in, what motivates you. You may want to invest in this. And, and we can bring you deals that New Fair is not investing in, but might meet some of um, you know that family office's uh, mandate or interests that doesn't meet ours. And we try to op open up those pro rata opportunities as much as possible. Thank you very much. So, you know, spinning off of that, Laura, I'd like to really pose the same question to you because I think it'll give us nice insight into your firm as well. You know, how do you handle direct investment requests from your LPs? And then how do you make the most of that relationship? So I think that'll give us a nice insight into your venture capital fund. And, and again, if you would expand upon your uh, background as well, I think that would be helpful to all those family offices looking to you know, deploy fresh capital. Yeah, um, so in terms of my background, it's eclectic. Um, I've had operating roles in technology. Um, I've shipped about a dozen products. I ran Corp Dev at a public company and I've been in venture for, I started in 2000, got out of venture, ran innovation at a really large bank and um, rejoined the venture ranks three years ago. And I sit on a couple of pretty large boards, um, CIBC US and um, Cinecron, which is a, a uh, cons global consultancy focused on digital transformation for um, financial institutions. So I often tell entrepreneurs, I'm probably gonna be the only venture capitalist you talk to who's bought technology as opposed to sold technology. Um, and I have a really good understanding of how and why large enterprises buy with an associated network of CIOs, CISOs, et cetera, um, which is appealing to entrepreneurs because um, most entrepreneurs really want two things from their venture capitalists. Um, they like customer introductions that lead to revenue and um, help team building. Um, I've participated in lots of research with students um, who uh, usually provide the paper afterwards. And there was one a number of years ago, an HBS student um, it was surveying both venture capitalists and entrepreneurs. And the entrepreneur VCs are like, we provide great strategic advice and all this other stuff. And the entrepreneur's like, we don't care about your strategic advice, but we do care about your customer intros. And you think you deliver up here and we think you deliver down here. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the gap, I'm sure that gap surprises you all, but um, in terms of um, making opportunities available to our, to our LPs, um, as a, we are a $60 million fund, seed and early, so we tend to do seed, seed plus, A, and obviously when you get to 100 million plus kind of valuations, we're not we can't take our pro rata. That's not what our LPs expect us to do. But we do create SPVs that we will offer to our LPs on a no fee, no carry basis. It's actually something that family offices find attractive because you get access to something that you probably wouldn't see otherwise until it goes public. Uh, we had a, a company recently in the security space, grossly oversubscribed and we offer that to our LPs when we're not going to take our piece of it. So, um, and we also, um, depending on the, with some of our larger LPs, we of course meet with them uh, regularly beyond the uh, quarterlies and provide insights into what we're seeing. And um, similarly, there are things that maybe on their wish list that don't fit um, our criteria in terms of what we'd invest in, but we make LPs aware of them. And you know, you have a sixty million dollar fund you know, at that level, what what's the largest size that a family office could invest with you now? Uh, into the fund or into a company? Yes. Into your fund. Uh, in, into a fund. I mean, we have um, uh, our family office checks range from sort of a half million to several million dollars. Um, and we have um, LPs that do five and 10. It just depends. But the family office checks tend to be uh, in the several million range. Fantastic. So Family offices out here today listening, you're thinking about your asset allocation, you're 40% into alts, BC deserves a place, and you can see you can really place large dollars into most of these funds, um, and more importantly, how do you get access? So having Laura and, uh, um, and Eric here today and Ellie gives you that idea of how to get in. So Eric, welcome. How are you? I'm great. Thanks, Matthew. Good morning. So when you and I spoke earlier, we talked a lot about you know um, venture capital founders, women. Um, and older founders. And you found that that was a really important place for, you know, family offices to be investing. Could you talk about why this group is a smart place for family offices to invest? Again, talking about venture capital founders as women and older founders. 
Uh, absolutely, but could I comment on the on the direct investment uh, as well? Of course, one one hundred percent. I'd love you to start there. That'd be great. Yes. Oh, okay. So sorry, you, you were breaking up for a minute, Matthew. I'm just going to take that as a yes. Um, uh, th thank you. It, it's great to be here. Um, it, it, as Matthew mentioned, um, I'm a founder and general partner of Impact Venture Capital. Um, after spending 30 plus years, I started life as an academic, spent 30 plus years in major corporates. 11 of those years as the treasurer at Oracle, um, where I you know, issued a lot of bonds to pay for acquisitions, and I managed the corporate venture portfolio at, at, at Oracle. Um, uh, then I spent uh, some time as CFO of uh, NAI Unicorn, C3AI, uh, before spinning out to, to found Impact Venture Capital in 2016. Um, we're an early stage firm uh, investing in applied AI. We're not as specialized in sector as, as some other folks are, but where we really differentiate ourselves is we collaborate with corporates. I spent much of my career with corporates and we, we uh, put ourselves out there as the corporate friendly independent VC. And we spend a lot of time meeting with the, the big uh, tech corporates to understand their priorities and to invest in young companies that have already caught the eye of the big corporates or that we think could catch the eye of the big corporates. So that in a nutshell is, is what we do. Uh, just quick comment on direct investment. We, we absolutely offer our LPs access uh, co-investment access to our deals. Uh, that's that's something that's very important to us. But what I want to just uh, point out that might be um, uh, unusual or surprising is that we offer that to our big institutional investors and to our family offices. But we found that a lot of the institutions can't react quickly enough. So some of our most important LPs uh, that are, you know, $5 million plus checks into a $25 million fund, we say, we've got this great co-investment opportunity you know, we need an answer in three weeks and the institutions struggle with that. But our family office LPs don't because they can make decisions quickly. So the direct investment opportunity that we offer, much like Lara and Ellie offer, um, I think are even more useful for the family offices because they're more agile. Um, and and that, that's the one thing I wanted to point out um, uh, in, in that domain. But let me just Matthew, interrupt you for, for yeah. one second, you know, for everybody in the room, again, the family offices, explain what that means, corporate friendly VC, break that down. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Um, you know, when I, um, when I initially went to work for Larry Ellison, I told him we should set up a, a corporate, um, a corporate venture uh, arm. And he said, no, he said 2001 taught him that corporate's the dumb money and he never wanted to be the dumb money. Um, so he, he kicked me out of his office. Um, and then a, a couple of years later, um, I came back and said, we've acquired 105 companies since I started. Many of them have their own corporate venture portfolios. We have, a, we have stakes in 180 startups. We have a corporate venture arm, whether you want one or not. Um, and Larry said, well, then you should manage it. And, and that's how I got into corporate venture capital, uh, uh, kind of with, inherited, uh, with an inherited portfolio. Um, but that was then and and what that but that what that represented was that a lot of independent VCs um, are, are a little bit disdainful of the corporates. They do think of them as you know big and slow and plotting and 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 they don't always get the respect that I think they deserve as a, as a former corporate VC. And and a lot of the explosion and growth in the venture landscape has come from corporates. In 2013, fewer than one in 10 venture-backed deals had a corporate investor. Last year, 78% of uh, venture-backed deals had a corporate investor. So corporates are driving the growth of venture, um, but a lot of the big um, household name firms still aren't particularly uh, good at partnering with corporates. I spent 30 plus years as an executive in corporates. Um, I didn't start my career in VC. And so what I bring is an integration of that corporate background with the venture background so that I'm the independent VC that can say to the corporates, I wanna meet with you quarterly. I wanna understand your technology priorities and I wanna use that to inform which startups we invest in. So that's what we mean by corporate. We're a little bit unusual. A lot of VCs, you know, Ellie differentiates herself by specializing in in eating, and and, and Lara's, you know, uh, you know, amazingly competent in the fintech space. We're not as narrow by sector, but where we differentiate ourselves is is with those corporate relationships. Um, and so, 
that that's a, a key part of of what we try to bring to the table. And and that doesn't mean we have a couple of corporates that are LP investors in our funds. Most corporates don't invest in funds, though, and we don't we don't need them to to partner with them. We're taking that relationship and and using that to tell the rest of you, you know, wh why why we think we might be um, a unique uh, uh, venture fund to invest in. So that's. Yeah, you know, that that's what we mean by corporate collaboration. Why it's so central uh, to so, what we do. So take take us to women and older founders. Tell me yeah. why that's an important aspect, not only for yourself but for other venture capital, you know, investors like you, but really for family offices that they sit there today thinking, how and where do I make allocation? So talk a little bit about women and older founders. I, I'd love to because I, I have a lot of passion around that. Um, so uh, women make up about 40% of entrepreneurs and historically have received, depending on which data you look at, somewhere between two and 6% of uh, venture-backed funding. Um, and so uh, it, it, women are vastly underrepresented and a lot of folks are paying lip service, if, if I can be candid, to trying to address that, but, but with fairly small pools of capital. Um, so that, that hasn't been fixed, it's getting better, but very slowly from a kind of a, a not 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 so great uh, start. At the same time, um, a lot of uh, a high percentage of venture capital goes to entrepreneurs under the age of thirty. Um, and you know, I, I started life as an academic. I'm about research. I co-authored a paper with some Berkeley faculty two years ago where we looked at the performance of women versus male founders and uh, older versus younger founders. And we found um, that women did at least as well in, you know, essentially identically to male uh, CEO founders in most regards. And the women were better in terms of having a, a shorter average time to exit. Um, so we concluded that the underrepresentation of women is a market inefficiency. It's a bias. There's not a, there doesn't appear to be a rational basis for it. Um, and as such, we think there's an arbitrage opportunity to gain you know, above average returns by giving women a fair shake. At the same time, uh, we also think that there's a bit of a bias against older entrepreneurs. Our best performing portfolio company, which is a software enabled chip company called Kornami, uh, the founder was 73 uh, when he started. He's, he's older than that now. Um, and uh, we just had SoftBank um, invest at about 20 times the valuation of our initial investment. Um, so um, we believe not just as a matter of social justice, but as a matter of, of pure arbitrage return that giving a fair shake to, to women and older entrepreneurs uh, can, can serve us well. Thank you. Uh, and the, the last comment I'll make on that is we also tried to look at uh, a racial background, but so few African-American entrepreneurs are funded, we couldn't even uh, generate a data set uh, to, to analyze that, uh, which kind of tells you everything you need to know about that. Um, uh, and so, so I'll pause there. No, yeah, fabulous. So, you know, family offices listening, you really heard about, you know, the the deep seated, you know, knowledge based older investment. And then you heard those, you know, amazing returns from women investments, uh, investors. So, Ellie, let me come back to you. You know, the modern eater. Let's talk about how, you know, New Fair invests in the modern eater. Um, but more importantly, what does that mean and, and how has it transformed your investment thesis and approach to looking at companies to put into your portfolio? Yeah, and great segue to what we just heard around, um, I think, just the makeup of America. So much of our thesis, which is centered around the concept of the modern eater, is a younger consumer and is a more racially diverse consumer. So. You know, you look at the U.S. in 1970, um, we were 90% white. Today, we're 43% racially diverse, and by 2035, expected to be over 50% um, non-white. So massive turnover in that sense, as well as um, massive turnover in terms of the wallet share dedicated to millennials and Gen Z. And when you look at those two populations, you know, food is everything to their identity, particularly when it comes to to Gen Z. And so. Um, I think we've really characterized a couple of things. There was um, this renaissance, as I mentioned before, from 2008, 2017, around the time that I was uh, at Whole Foods, we saw this incredible growth in terms of natural foods and um, the way Americans started thinking about health. And what's so interesting to me now is that Gen Z and this younger population sort of takes all of that for granted. They um, they expect that the foods and the brands that they're buying from are, in many cases, organic, 
non-GMO, free from the things that they want to see, socially responsible. There, those are table stakes. So what we really look at is what this younger consumer is sort of demanding or expecting today, and the bar has been set that much higher. Um, and that really comes to climate consciousness, uh, purpose, mission, and integrity. And so you look at the values that this younger consumer has and what they're expecting, and a lot of that actually attaches to digital enablement and what they now can see or get back from the brands that they're supporting. So they want to feel connected to the founders that they're buying from. They want to understand the mission and purpose of those brands. Um, and they want to feel like they're part of a community that's being built and generated. And there's an always on engagement with those brands, which is, you know, entirely lives online. So what gets us excited and how we think about our investments is um, not only certainly product integrity, foundational pieces to investments you want to see in terms of gross profit margin and any any number of um, business metrics but on like sort of the larger thesis level we need to see brands that have met the promise that was um, probably built and and created over the last 10 15 years and then is doing so much more to keep that consumer captivated and um, connected to your mission and maybe the last thing i'll say is that you know one category we look at a ton right now is um, global flavors. And we look at founder-led brands that are bringing highly authentic representative flavors to the table, um, which tracks so much with what, what we've talked about in terms of demographic shifts. Um, and there being a more adventurous, younger eater who's excited about global cuisine. Um, and so there, there are a lot of different transfers in terms of where people are spending their money um, and, and how excited they are by these types of companies. So we, we really track that in our approach. And then I guess the last comment I'll make in terms of new fair and, and how we operate, having such an operational background, um, I skipped over a part of, I was a CEO of a, a co-packing company, a manufacturing company um, for a couple of years, which has really informed also digging in and being extremely hands-on with our portfolio. My co-founder um, has a large marketing digital and brand background. She's She was in financial technology for years. And so um, we really intend to play a hands-on role. And I think Laura made this point earlier. We, we actually want to be that strategic capital that is helping you recruit and ta um, find talent that's helping you navigate your retail strategy because we've done it before. But, you know, you mentioned something about lived online, you know, talk a little bit about that. What do you mean when you say the millennial or the Gen Z, they live online and, and how does that relate to food? Yeah, I think it's, it's so amazing to think about the way that consumer brands built their success 15 years ago when I started my Whole Foods days in this journey. Um, it, it was brick and mortar. It was pounding the pavement, getting yourself in retail distribution, connecting with, you know, in-store with demos. Today, that has flipped so much that discovery happens online. Uh, Gen Z and the generations uh, lower, they report significantly over 80% feel that they live their lives online. That is, that's where they're spending most of their time and how they're engaging. And so in order for them to get excited about a brand or a company, they most often need to be interacting with that company, that brand, the team and people and supply chains behind it online and, and digitally as well. Wow, absolutely. And, and Laura, let me just flip over to you, you know, and FinTech and, and your fund, SVC, when we spoke earlier in the week, your comment was, you know, in due diligence, there is no substitute for time. Expand upon that, because I thought that was such an interesting comment. Yeah, I mean, you, um, so Y Combinator, come see a bunch of pitches and give us a thumbs up after a 15 minute pitch so that you can invest is the inverse of that, right? So understand when you actually have the luxury, which we haven't had over the last certainly several years and probably longer, um, to get to know a company, to see how successful are they at closing sales, gaining customers, adding to their team, what have you, that if you're actually, in my view, doing the job of a venture, you know, somebody, I mean, I'm a fiduciary. I take other people's money. I take that very seriously. I cannot possibly meet someone and say, yeah, I'm going to invest in their company in 15 minutes or less. Um, but there is, you will learn things about, um, what's the chemistry like? How good is the person at recruiting? How good are they with customers? But you can't do that in 15 minutes. You can't do it in a week. Um, so 
time tends to tell you a lot as you, it's not just the length of time, but your engagement with a company, following some kind of process, seeing if you, you know, for me, I tell companies we're investing early. I'll, if, if I'm interested, I'll make some introductions from my network as potential customers rather than burning through through um, their customers. Because having shipped product, I know how valuable customer relationships are. And by the time you know the tenth venture capitalist has called one of your three customers, the customer is calling the company, going, "Are you still going to be in business?" Because I've talked like ten investors, and. Um, you know how, and then I get feedback though from the companies I've introduced. You know, would you buy this, etc. I can't do that if I have no time. So that's why I say there is no substitute for uh, in diligence for time. Um, and I think that um, as difficult as um, venture is appearing and the down rounds that are coming and have happened. Um, I think it's really healthy because you aren't going to have this, oh, you've got to make a decision in 15 minutes or less. Um, um, and certainly as an, a potential LP, if that's how people are, are making their decisions, that's probably a fund I'd avoid. So go back to the idea of fiduciary. You know, it's a great idea. I mean, the three of you are running funds. The three of you are fiduciaries. What else should family offices be thinking about as they're turning to you as a fiduciary, what, what, how else do you see your role um, inside of your own fund? I mean, are you advising the family office, this is a right investment, a wrong investment? Will you ever actually say, hey, we're the wrong venture fund for you, you should be looking at something else, or maybe you're not allocating enough of your $100 million portfolio either to alts or us? How do you, how do you see yourself as a fiduciary when you talk to a family office? Um, You know, I think it's a... I would never advise. I'm not. I'm not an RIA. I'm not providing investment advice to a to a family office. I mean, but certainly, if they say, "Gee, do you do, you know, you like fintech? Would you invest in a company like Chime?" I have no idea how to do Facebook ad arbitrage. Personally, I thought Chime had a horrible customer demographic that no other online bank wanted, or no certainly offline bank wanted. I didn't understand the valuation. But if you want to do consumer fintech, we're not for you. Uh, we don't do that. We don't know how to do that. Um, so I think, you know, understanding, you know, look, I think this is true for startups as well. Understanding what you don't do is right. every bit as important right. as what you do. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll certainly tell, oh, do you do, you know, the, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Marty. Um, so, um, for us, yeah, I mean, if, if there are certain interests that families or any LP has that we don't cover, well, we're not the right fund. Great. I think that's so important to be Matt, able to, oh, uh, oh. Matt, but Marty has a question. So do you think that there's going to be a ripple effect from SBF Ventures and other crypto guys who have venture capital funds and we're investing in fintech? Uh, is there going to be like a claw? There's going to be a lot of clawbacks, right? What do you think the impact's going to be of that? Um, so I don't, do, Matt, could you guys hear uh, Marty's question, which is um, with the implosion of FTX and, and obviously the ripple effects across crypto and a lot of those um, crypto funds had venture funds, is there going to be a ripple effect? Certainly in crypto, you're already seeing that, right? The Winklevoss, uh, twin, the Winklevi, I think, uh, with Gen, you know, have issues with their fund. They're accusing, you know, other, I forget which uh, crypto company. To, yeah, exactly. Barry Silver. Oh, this guy's a fraud. You're going to have lots more of that. I think um, clearly, uh, I don't know if it's crypto winter or not, but. Um, so they are also fintech investors outside of crypto. Yeah, that, and. and, and, and SBF invested in free companies. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, yeah, absolutely. So absolutely, you're going to have dead, now you're going to have dead wood in the cap table. And depending on how big a piece um, Sam Bankman Freed or others were of a particular company. If the company is not doing great, you're going to have people do preemptive down rounds to wash them out of the cap table. Um, if, they can, if, if they can, if they can, right? Well, if they can get those deals done. But yeah, I think it's going to be really ugly for fintech companies who have significant money from those uh, entities. And obviously, um, we're not done with um, whatever the ripple effects are from the FTX bankruptcy. I would just add, I, I, the ripple effects won't just be from those companies. But I mean, we we have an we have a um, alternative blockchain architecture company in our portfolio that's raising funds. Has nothing to do. Okay, completely different but you know you know they're going from riding this wave of you know positive that had nothing to do with them now they're on a negative wave that has nothing to do with them so so right and 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 so you know in fact you know their technology is designed to fix some of the issues 
you know, that, 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 that are bringing down some of the others, but it's hard for them to, to make that differentiated message in this environment. Yeah, I mean, I think Alex yeah. Mashinsky also was a venture capital investor. So all these guys who are going to be clawed back, their I, funds will, will have massive impact. Well, I also think you'll see this, and it depends how big a proportion, you'll have um, a bunch of these folks who are LPs in venture funds, and those funds are going to struggle because you're going to have capital calls that no, you know people don't show up for. And depending how much that is of, of a fund, that's going to get ugly because if you don't make your capital calls, that ends up at zero and uh, in terms of your capital call account. But then the question is, how much of that makes up the capital of a fund, and, and is the fund still viable? I mean, another way to look at it is maybe really great fintech companies will be very cheap to acquire, and, and that might be good. It'll be good for the large banks if they uh, have, have the courage of uh, the conviction, yeah. Or for a VC to invest in them, yeah. That too. Uh, it's just VCs tend to be less excited about huge down rounds historically, so. I, I, I like to say that right now it's it's a bad time to exit, but a great time to invest. Well, okay. Eric, let me let me pick up on that because you and I, you know, spoke earlier in the week and we talked about early stage and late stage investors that BC is a long term investment play. How does that, you know, family office seek access to either the early stage, or the late stage and, you know, the various funds out there can be confusing. What do you think the best way for a family office to gain access? Well, well, I think this ties into your earlier question about like what advice do we give, and and, and you know, I I I, I want to start by being an ambassador for venture as an asset class, um, and I always tell family offices, I I don't know what the optimal allocation to venture is, but I can tell you it's not zero, um, and and I can also make an argument that it should be higher today than maybe it was a couple of years ago because of the elevated risk in some traditional asset classes, you know, where, where the S&P, you know, since January 2020, just before COVID, the S&P has been down 31%, up 49%, and, and today is up about 19%. So it's a wild ride in the S&P um, and in some other asset classes. And I think that venture has some good characteristics because it isn't, uh, it doesn't move in lockstep, uh, at least in the short term, um, you know, it, it tends to go up and down at different times than some of the other asset classes. So, so I, I you know, I, I try to make the point that venture as an asset class makes sense within a, a well diversified portfolio. Now, I've had VCs where I've made my case and they've said, oh, we're going to go from 0% to 100%. I'm like, you know, I'm not an RIA, but I don't think you should do that. You shouldn't have all your money in, in venture or any one asset class. But I think there's a real role for venture. Um, going down a level, I would argue that um, a lot of people consider venture an asset class. I think early stage venture and late stage venture are distinctly different asset classes. I'm a representative of the early stage venture class. Um, but, you know, when I invest in a company, it's not about to go public. Um, and I think that with the ongoing delays, you know, 20 years ago, as soon as you had some success, you went public. And, and that so the distinction was less uh, noticeable then. Now you have companies that in the old days would have gone public long ago. They're still technically private companies, but Facebook in 2011, you know, Uber in 2015, were, were not like the startups that I invest in. And if you look at, um, at long run returns over asset classes, late stage venture and early stage venture have very different risk return characteristics. Over long horizons, early stage has tended to be the best performing um, asset class. Um, and, you know, and that's where I live. Uh, where, you know, I'm investing in companies where a relatively small check can still, you know, yield a, a, a reasonably uh, high uh, ownership stake uh, in a company. So, um, you know, so that's that's where where, where venture is. Um, in, in the current year, um, you've seen a little bit less deployment by venture firms, both late and early stage. They're deploying less of their capital. They have a, a lot of dry powder. But you know, they're, they're deploying less capital than they were in, you know, 2021 and 2022, but relative to any year from 2019 prior, it's still uh, bigger. Venture is still a bigger space, even with the recent retrenchment. And, and I think there's still a, a role for venture to play, but I think there was a question back there. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, when you refer to early stage venture, and you have mentioned a relatively small check yields, you know, hopefully a good return, would you describe a relatively small check? Well, I, that's different for different managers. And for us, um, you know, a, a, a common check size for us initially is five hundred thousand. So we might invest, you know, five hundred thousand in a 
in, in a young startup worth five to ten million dollars. So we're getting you know five or ten percent ownership stake, and we do keep some reserves so that we can follow on for a while. Um, you know, so we might invest seed. Often we're the first institutional money in. So there's some angels, and then we're the first institutional money in, and then we pass the baton off to a bigger investor. In our case, often a corporate investor, but uh, or, or just an investor that writes bigger checks and in, in more mature companies. And we stay with it for a while, where we might invest our pro rata. Then we might drop out. We might uh, form an SPV. To I, I gave an example of Kornami earlier. Um, we invested at a $12 million valuation, and a year ago, SoftBank invested at over a $200 million valuation in the same company. That was no longer appropriate for our thesis, you know, to 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 make new investment in. But we formed an SPV, and some of our investors chose to make that later stage investment along with SoftBank. And so it was an it's an example of of, of that co-investment opportunity. But for us, um, you know, uh, we we've written checks as small as 250,000 as big as 2 million, but usually 500,000, occasionally a million is, is a typical check size for us. Yeah. And we're very similar. Um, sort of we, in a seed, the most we'll do is a million um, as an initial investment. And Ellie, what's the most you would do in an initial investment? It's right around there. A million max we'd ever anticipate would be 1.5. And, you know, Eric, just to go back to you, I quickly looked up the uh, big corporates. It's Amazon, Facebook, Google, and Microsoft, you know, have had uh, their own uh, venture capital funds for over a decade. So, you know, those four people think about, gee, you know, they're just insulated, Amazon, and Facebook, or Google. But no, they obviously have their uh, number of investments they make, like when you were at uh, Oracle with uh, Larry Ellison. So let me flip back to you, Ellie. Um, let's talk about trends. Let's talk about trends in investing in funds that uh, LPs would be interested to hear about and see. And then how does that equate back to your Matt, team? Matt, and how does that Matt, equate Matt. back to your team? Yeah. Matt, Matt. Marty has something to say. Oh. Uh, so Matt, you brought up the fact that all these guys are heavily involved in venture capital. We also did uh, that Facebook, et cetera, are involved in, in venture capital, right? Correct. Right. And so... They also are the largest acquirers. I think that Facebook and Google and Amazon have all acquired more than 200 companies in the last 20 years. Each one of them, right? Yeah, yeah you're 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 giving my marketing pitch. Um, thank you, Marty. No, that that's awesome. I mean, that that's that's why we are collaborating with with uh, corporates early because we think that that gives a, a better probability weighted, uh, you know, expected uh, ability to find an acquirer later. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you left out Intel, which has been doing corporate venture longer than anyone, and it was so large in the bubble before the uh, in uh, before 2000. I think they had an earnings blip in a positive way from their write ups in their venture portfolio or exits. So um, it can be really meaningful. And a lot of corporate venture, I've worked with corporate VCs. That I, we only had corporate investors in my first fund in 2000. Um, they do it to open the aperture, right? It's a great way for a large corporate to spend a pretty modest check to get to know a company. So it's absolutely, uh, uh, honestly, sometimes really good scouting for their corp dev teams. Well, yeah, I, 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 I say it's a triad. Uh, they've got uh, internal R&D, M&A, and corporate venture. And corporate venture gets you access to technology for the smallest amount of dollars deployed if you're a big corporate. So more of them are leaning on that on that leg of the triad. Absolutely. So go ahead, Ellie. One thing I might just add, just being a bit out of the tech space, it's interesting to hear this just because on the more like the, I would say Luddite um, side of things, which is largely food and Bev and retailers um, have really tried in the last 10 years to build those corp dev programs. And in many cases are figuring it out as we speak. And we've had experiences in our portfolio already. As an example, Chewy, um, the, the pet retailer, sort of the Amazon of pets, is just this year trying to roll out their M&A and biz dev program. And we were have been sort of their guinea pig in one of our portfolio companies, a premium pet um, brand called Made by Nacho. And watching, I, I think there's just such a recognition, as Laura said, of how um, accretive that can be and getting, you know, retailers and e-com marketplaces just constantly being, I think, hammered on, on their margins and how they're going to continue to grow in this environment are, are moving to corp dev programs to try to see some of that benefit. 
And, you know, going back to the modern eater, going back to your time at Whole Foods for 10 years, what are the trends right now? What, do you, what are you seeing that, you know, LPs are looking for? Yeah, I mean, on the investment side, I think it's interesting. We look at a lot of different things, so much attached to um, this shift in terms of palate, in terms of younger consumers. Um, we're largely following food as medicine as a, a pretty major shift, um, so much coming out of the pandemic. This was already, um, we were seeing tailwinds in, in food as medicine before the pandemic, and it's it's been um, accelerated, I think, by more Americans being mindful of their health and what it can do to healthcare costs to um, be putting better things into your body. We think a lot about um, short form eating and, and snacking. You know, when I, a lot of what we think about is just, you know, I think about uh, my parents' refrigerator, I think about my refrigerator, and then I think about my nieces and nephews who are, are and, and the way they eat and the frequency of eating. So we look a lot at fresh snacking and how people are um, now eating less, but more frequently over the course of the day and how work from home dynamics have uh, adjusted formats when and how much people can be eating on the go and, and um, you know, have access to refrigerators or freezers. There's a lot of these, these things happening. Um, and we think a lot about the premium pet and baby category, particularly right now, it's important for us to be looking at, you know, we're lucky to be in food, which is largely a good place to be during a potential recession or just a downturn. Um, but categories like baby and like pet have been um, really resilient in tough times and we, we don't expect consumers to trade down um, and then the, maybe the last big one that I mentioned earlier that we're looking a ton at is global flavors um, and just seeing so much of maybe where Americans were once being exposed to new cuisines um, at restaurants that the, those types of brands and experiences are entering grocery and mass and conventional and performing really well. And Jessica Alba launched her company, The Honest Company, and just hit it out of the park. Do you see more celebrities enter, uh, entering the you know modern eating space? And is that somebody you would collaborate with? Would absolutely collaborate with with her, sure. Um, but no, I think it's a it's a massive space. It is. I am getting phone calls left and right from big time content creators and TikTok influencers and chefs who are recognizing that there is a new distribution platform, which is the modern celebrity. Um, I was lucky to co-found a brand with the chef Bobby Flay um, called Made by Nacho, the premium cat brand that I mentioned. Oh, and I think having I that had su early success, we might have someone, yeah. Um, have We've seen some major success in how quickly that brand accelerated. Um, Bobby Flay, who some people know as a Food Network chef, is a major cat lover. He has a cat named Nacho Flay, and Nacho has 250,000 followers on Instagram, which was an immediate 250,000 potential customers that we had direct access to. So I think in terms of accelerating and catering to your customer segment, having the Jessica Alba, who you expect her her base and her followers to care about health, to care about their families. It's a really, it's sort of the new go to market strategy that's more efficient and um, and accelerates young. So brands. when can I expect the Kardashians to have their own food line? Okay, so <laughs> let, exactly. So Eric, let me come back to you. Um, let's talk about you know Bill Gurley. Bill Gurley, you know, is is out there. He's adamant. He talks from Benchmark. And, and he always says that, you know, founders should ignore whatever period we're in, the economic conditions, and just go into launch mode. Is that true today? Uh, yeah, well, I, I I don't know if they should completely ignore it, but the, but the thrust of it is, you know, I think true because, it, it, you know, the current, by the time any company that launches today exits, um, to, you know, today's crisis will be a distant memory. Um, you know, we, we've got a we, we've got a, a page in our in our overview that shows the companies that launched right after the 2008 crisis, and it includes you know Uber and uh, you know and, and a host of other you know companies that went on to do very well. Now, what it does mean if you launch today, you probably aren't going to get the valuation that you would like to get as an entrepreneur uh, because, you know, some of the VCs are retrenching a little, um, which is why it's a great time to invest. Um, you, you know, we're, we're finding that we can, uh, we, you know, get terms that we find very investor favorable right now. Um, and so we think it's a great time to invest. 
and not such a good time to exit. Uh, so yes, in that sense, it's a great time to both launch and invest in a company because it's going to take a while for that company to mature and the current economic conditions will not be relevant by the time that company's ready to exit. So Stacy, let's pick up on Eric's theme, you know, getting paid to wait for an exit. If I'm a real estate investor, I don't buy a multifamily house or storage for the next three to five years. I'm thinking seven to 15 years and generational. Talk about, you know, why there's no additional management fees um, when an exit is looming. Why is that interesting? I'm sorry, Laura, that was directed to you. My fault. You know, again, get, getting paid to wait for an exit, no additional management fees. Um, and, you know, when there's an exit looming, why is that important for a family office? Um. I'm not quite sure I understand your question, but I think it's important because you don't, I mean, look, venture funds have 10 year lives, lots of extensions. And when you're doing really early, it can be, you know, 14 years and um, fun, funds are not taking management fee, obviously, but you, and you don't want them to, and you don't want people to be forced to exit within um, a certain time frame. I mean, on the one hand, it's nice to get all of the capital back, but you don't want people to exit with a gun to their head because then you're held hostage to whatever the prevailing environment is at the time. So I think um, not having fees late in uh, in fund cycles um, is alignment of interest, just pure and simple. Right. And, and I think that's so important. So uh, uh, Ellie, let me come back to you in terms of like cash flow rights. I mean, I know how important that is, um, incentives for uh, VCs to perform. Could you sort of talk about that a little bit? Because you know, I sat with a family office recently and, and we were thinking about asset allocation and they were talking about cash flow rights. So help a family office understand that in, in investing in a VC. Yeah, I mean, I think it does come down to a lot of what Laura just said of um, preserving capital, being smart about when you're allocating and also being really mindful of the moment. I mean, we've, I, I will say we've pivoted slightly in terms of our capital deployment and expect to deploy more this year given where we are and, and assuming that we're going to see some really good deals in 2023. So that's going to adjust um, what we're taking in and how much we're taking in terms of fees. So um, that should all inform, I think, then cash flow rights and how you're there as a supportive partner into your portfolio. And Eric, let me just move over to you. You know, when we spoke earlier in the week, we talked about a resilient new generation of founders will emerge. A new ecosystem will come out. Um, you know, we talked about nobody ever really heard of Round Rock, Texas. That's where Dell came out of. Menlo Park, obviously, Facebook and the rest of the world. But then I never really thought, OK, am I investing in, in an ecosystem in, in Austin, Texas? That's te Tesla. And then when Amazon and Microsoft popped it, all of a sudden, Seattle, Washington became interesting. So talk about this new generation of uh, founders and this new ecosystem that's out there. Well, I, I think you're getting at two interesting uh, themes that, that, you know, distinctly, one is about uh, new founders. I mean, a lot of a lot of people are getting laid off. A lot of talented people are getting laid off right now. Some subset of them are going to go start new companies. Um, and some of those companies will be good. Um, so uh, when the big companies have layoffs, that creates talent uh, for the small companies. Um, and so I, I think it'll be interesting to see that play out. As an investor, I'm intrigued because there'll be probably more startups. And in this environment, I I'm, feel like I'm in the driver's seat on valuation. I keep I keep offering lower valuations thinking I'm insulting an entrepreneur and they end up thanking me. And so I decided maybe I'm not getting low enough. You know, I, I got to keep going lower till, till, till they start insulting me. Um, and, and, and so it, it, I think it's a great environment to invest in. The second element of your question around geography, I do think that a lot of other ecosystems are trying to be the Silicon Valley of X. Um, and with partial success. And, and I do think you're going to see a more democratized, less geographically centralized um, sources of, of innovation. But I don't think any of them are going to overtake Silicon Valley anytime soon. Um, I, it does seem to require you get at least one big success before you get on the map. Uh, Seattle had Microsoft and Amazon before it became a big venture ecosystem. Austin had Dell before it became a big venture ecosystem. And so you kind of need that one initial success. Uh, and that creates a lot of local millionaires who are excited about startups. Um, and, 
but it, it requires more than that. It requires more than one local success, more than just putting capital next to a research university. In Silicon Valley, it's so much about culture. Um, and it's really hard to replicate the culture here because this is a culture where people are allowed to have failed. Uh, in a lot of other cities in this country and particularly in other countries, if you do something and fail, it, you're sort of stigmatized for life. Um, and, 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 it, and, and that risk-taking culture isn't a, a, as evident as it is here in the Valley. Um, and so I think that the, that culture is an important uh, element to the success of the Valley. It's also a very small Valley. It's really easy to get to know people here. Um, I always like to say it's shockingly easy to get a first meeting with really impressive, rich, famous people, um, but it's pretty hard to get a second meeting. Um, you, you know, you, you have to really dazzle them on the, on the first try. So I do think we'll see the growth in geographies outside of Silicon Valley, but I don't think they'll overtake Silicon Valley, you know, anytime soon. Well, and I think COVID changed. I think COVID also expanded that because you no longer ha felt like, oh, gee, I have to have the whole team in one place. I don't know where the where everything will land on that, but I certainly talk to entrepreneurs who either have fully virtual or partially virtual teams, much more so than they had four or five years ago. And Laura, let me just stay with you. You know, you and I talked a little bit about, um, you know, a flight back to competence, a flight back to competence for founders who were launching last year, this year. Um, you know, that this is a long-term journey. Can you talk a little bit about that and your comment? Yeah, I mean, before um, the last year, you've had, a, I mean, we've had the greatest bull market in technology ever from sort of 2009 until last year. So you literally have entrepreneurs, employees um, who are not necessarily super young because they're now over 30, um, who've never seen a down cycle. Um, and they think every market is up and to the right, or maybe it's like COVID and maybe it's a six month blip. Um, you know, uh, that's not a great thing because you actually learn some humility, what might go wrong. And so I, and not everything is going to succeed in a market like this. And that means actually your operating competence will matter. I personally think that is a terrific thing. It's a terrific thing for investors and um, because you'll actually have people who I think know, um, know what they're doing and hopefully a flight back to some good governance. I mean, for the last 15 years in Silicon Valley, it's um, been all about, and I love founders, but it's been about the um, uh, deification of founders. So we can't be seen as founder unfriendly. If you haven't read um, uh, The Billion Dollar Loser, which is the sort of biopic of WeWork, it was interesting and disturbing because Bill Gurley's partner, Bruce Dunleavy, who I regard as the ultimate adult, Bill, uh, he's in his 60s. He's on the board of WeWork, and WeWork was a bigger mess than anything we've all read. And throughout the book, he's saying, well, we can't be seen as founder unfriendly. Like, it's okay that they're running his and hers, Adam and his wife's G5s through the company, which, of course, is a complete abdication of your fiduciary responsibility to the board of the company on which you serve as well as to your LPs. But because they had the bad um, experience in the press with Travis and, and ousting him, which was a Bill Gurley deal for Uber, Benchmark was terrified of being seen as founder unfriendly. As a governing principle, that is a really lousy place to be as an investor, if that's really what you're focused on. Wow. It's um, always a bad sign when they make TV shows and hire actors to play you. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, it's so cringy. <laughs> I, I watched like one episode. I'm like, I can't, I having read the book, I can't watch it. Yeah. Well, yeah. wait a minute. What about the comedy series, Silicon Valley? I mean, I loved it. I can't watch that. I, yeah, I can't watch I that. Love the Silicon I love Silicon Valley. And, you know, people, I think their first introduction to tech was like, well, wait a minute, is that how an incubator works? Is that what's going on there? And, you know, talking about cheap space. So I thought, you know, funny series about in terms of the Silicon Valley. But Ellie, let me come back to you. Let's talk about capital. No, there's Let's a question. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry, Sorry Matt, we, have a, we have a question in back. Right uh, up, the guys, another. You are asking a question that I've actually asked other VCs. There are actually several, whether it's Adam Newman, there's um, uh, Renee, who was running uh, Lending uh, lending Club, which he was ousted for fraud, right? He raised capital. Mike Cagney serially sexually harassed you know, his employees. He's raised capital. And I've asked VCs when I was at RBC, I asked a group of VCs because they were all talking about what they look for in founders and not a single one of them mentioned anything about ethics. 
And, um, and I asked the question. I said, you're asking people like me to buy their companies, to invest, to partner with. Their bad press reflects poorly on me. And they're all like, uh, uh, well, we, that, we took that for granted. I'm like, really? So I, I can't, I, I'm the wrong person to ask. In reality, this motion deal is hard to I, I think they look and they go, hey, he, ultimately he made money. So he's a winner. I, I, but there are things I don't do for money. Allie, let's go back to you. Let's stay with this theme of, you know, um, founders, founders edge and allocating capital. Does it matter that, or is it important that how fast a founder raises money or that round he's going into isn't doing so well? How do you look at that as a uh, VC investor? Well, it's a very topical ask because I think, um, you know, Eric was getting at this a uh, couple of questions ago. It's a very, very different environment. So on the one hand, 2021, early 2022, I think you really, you did watch that. You you wondered if uh, an entrepreneur or founder was um, having trouble raising money, what was going on there. But I think also to Lara's points, that may have been for the wrong reasons. It was, you know, there's been so much capital available that um, for m many entrepreneurs that, that probably never should have been raising uh, the amount that they did, were able to do that handily. So now I think we're in a reset. The contraction has been really good for discipline and actually um, pressuring founders to show some austerity, to show that discipline and to show that they're gonna be able to um, perform. And in many cases, I think that's been just really humbling. I mean, it's it's a moment of a lot of these founders that sort of what they were commanding or directing last year, they are not in a position um, to do that anymore. And, and But also hopefully you're involved in companies that that had some level of humility or just recognition of, of sort of what they could do um, and that that's faring okay this year, even in this environment, but it's a really new moment um, for founders and entrepreneurs. Um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to hop early, but thank you so much for having me. I'm getting kicked out of my room. <laughs> thank you all. You too, bye-bye, thank you. So Eric, thank let you. me let me come to you. Um, and, you know, a question that I know family offices, you know, get a lot because I hear it every now and then is, you know, should I invest in a club deal? You know, my VC fund is going into a club deal. Is this really a great way to, you know, spread the risk? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, a club deal is just a subset of, you know, co-investors. So I, I don't think that the, the fact that it's a club deal is inherently bad. It's just a way of saying, you know, you're doing it with multiple investors. And, and I think that you, you know, venture has always been a little bit of a herd mentality. And I think that it's almost becoming more of a herd mentality in this challenging environment. Um, you know, in 2021, 2022, if a founder was having trouble raising, but I had confidence because, you know, I thought I had some unique information. I, I was, you know, confident that if I got behind it and made a few calls, I could find somebody to join us and we could get critical mass. Um, it, when other VCs are pulling back, that means that I have to now not just think, do I believe in the CEO, but I have to think, will the CEO be able to convince other venture investors to join? And, and that almost uh, forces a herd mentality, which I hate because all VCs say they're rugged and independent, but it's it's rarely true. Um, and and I think that in this current environment, um, I can believe in a company, but but worry that they won't, you know, the CEO might be awkward or, you know, you, you know, I might have not to have as much faith that they're going to be able to raise capital from other folks in a scarcer capital environment. So some of these concerns can become self-fulfilling. We end up making uh, commitments along the lines of we'll put 500,000 in contingent on the round being at least 2 million. Um, cause we don't want to be all the capital, you know, in the round. And, um, and, and then we have to go help the entrepreneur, you know, raise the rest, whether that's a club deal or some other form of just finding, uh, co-investors. And, and Laura, let me just move to you quickly. You know, let's just talk about an exit. Um, you know, Matt, venture we have about funds, one minute left, Matt. No, no problem. You know, venture funds typically split profits, you know, um, with the fund manager, the general partner, the limited partner, the family office. How what's the mindset of a family office thinking about splits, you know, uh, between profits and the funds? How should they enter into that agreement? Well, funds have pretty um, most funds have pretty typical um, 
limited partner, partner agreements. It's a lot like hedge funds, um, although with hedge funds, it's a business model rather than uh, anything else. But it's uh, you could expect to give up 20 percent of the profit to the general partner that gets allocated among that group. And um, I, I think there are some interesting structures some have done, like when they say, gee, if we hit a 3x, we'll do a 25 percent carry. I, I think that um, those things are possible if you're really interested in align, aligning interests. But um, I'd, I'd focus more on choosing the right um, stewards for your capital, um, and hopefully they don't have an egregious fee structure. I mean, there are funds like Sequoia who get 30 percent, but they've also had historically a 6x uh, kind of multiple return. So, um, and if you can get into Sequoia, good luck. Uh, thank you. Marty, I want to thank you for, you know, putting this venture capital group together. Um, I want to thank k &L Gates, obviously, for, you know, what they do. And then again, family offices that are out there today, you know, please know that both, you know, Laura and Eric and Ellie have venture funds. You know, they are looking for the right strategic investors. And if this is something for you, please reach out to them. Thank you, Marty. Great job, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you. So I just want to make a comment on the last panel. So, uh, you know, we have many family offices who are interested in venture. A lot of them are over allocated, but their number one priority is rights to future rounds. So what people really don't know, and I think that Eric was talking about the difference between late stage and early stage is that family offices flood into late stage rounds, right? I mean, they, so uh, I know for a fact that when Facebook and Uber, I, I guess it was Uber, everybody knew it was going to be a down round after it went public, right? They're saying, this is going to, this is not going to sustain the price. But Asian family offices went into Uber stock so vigorously. Yeah. I mean, I had a couple of Asian family offices coming. We want to buy 300 million in secondaries, 500 million, because they just want to be in in the round. They want the name, right? So, so, so family offices, they're really a lot of them are really about rights, right? So we had like a actually, it's a it's a, it's a very well known. There's a, a guy named Alex here from Wharton. He's a well known early stage investor for 10, 20 years. And he was coming to raise around in New York, and there was a family office. He said, "How big of a, how big are you raising?" I'm raising ten million dollars, like his second fund. And uh, the family office, well, we're like a billion dollar family office. We could take the whole round, but you know, we're constrained. We can't. Our only interest is is future rights, right? That's that's it. We want to be able to get access when that when you have a unicorn. We want to be able to get in at the right pricing rather than at the secondary pricing, which has a premium on it, right? So that's a big deal. Secondly. I mean, people are, you know, it, the market was bonkers last year, but it's still bonkers, right? I just got, I was on the phone with a guy, I'm not sure if he's in LA or San Francisco. He's like, yeah, you know, I just raised $60 million. I said, How, how's that? What are you doing? Says, I'm running a pet telemedicine and concierge business. So, I mean, you know, telemedicine is a big craze, right? Because of COVID. Now they have pet telemedicine. Think about it. 